Hello, my name is Craig Apperson, and I am a recent member of the, the Civil War Roundtable group, thanks to Mike Mobius talking me into it because he knew I was a history buff. And I'm here to, today to talk about Civil War trauma as it relates to how the uh, soldiers dealt with trauma at the time, how the professionals dealt with trauma at that time, and, and how we deal with it today, uh, from my experience as the former director of the Army National Guard Psychological Health Program. This is a 30,000 foot view of this. We won't have time to go into lots of details, but I wanna give you a taste of both how they saw things back in the Civil War and how we see it today. So we're gonna start with a couple of cases. One is John Hilt. 25 year old corporal from Michigan. He lost his right arm to amputation after being wounded. And what, the, what was seen after this happened was that he became withdrawn, <clears throat> apathetic, at times so excited and disturbed that he hit other people. Um, and he was sent to the government hospital for the insane, which is now called St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, DC. You can see it, what it looked like in the early 1900s to your right, and he was a diagnosed with acute mania. We're gonna spend a little time talking about diagnoses back then. He had no prior history of mental or emotional problems, and, but he was retained at the hospital until his death in 1911. So this is a very dramatic event that led to his life in a very negative trajectory. So another soldier on the Confederate side was Lucian Rhoda Fuel. He was in the 17th Virginia Infantry in George Pickett's division. He fought for three years uh, for the South, but he was captured in uh, 1864 and wound up going to what the inmates called Camp Elmira up in Elmira, New York. And a lot of soldiers brought to these POW camps all kinds of diseases and disorders. And so the, the medical care was inadequate uh, on a good day. And so it wasn't a pleasant experience for anybody there. When he got out, he began to show all kinds of signs of violence. He was repeatedly found guilty in court of assault and battery, more than five men and, and the the, the worst was when he went into an actual jail and shot a guy seven times and killed him for kidnapping his sister. In each instance, Lucian was acquitted um, of the murder by reason of insanity. Reason of insanity was a relatively new diagnosis at the time. And so he got off. So, Leadership was not immune from any of this. A lot of the leaders in the Civil War on both sides fought right along with their soldiers and they experienced some of the same traumatic events. Confederate General John Hunt Morgan was known to be greatly changed. His face wore a weary and careworn expression and his manner was destitute of its former ardor and enthusiasm very flavorful language they used back then. George McClellan, he was in such dire straits that on the battle, at the Battle of Antietam, he stayed in his tent until 7 a.m. and his, he wasn't giving his generals any kind of direction or supervision. Uh, Lincoln's removal, it was noted, of McClellan may have precluded a total breakdown. Confederate General Richard Stoddard Ewell. This was a, a, a general that lost his leg, uh, had some pretty significant successes in battle earlier in the war, but when he got to the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, he began whipping his soldiers because they weren't doing what he wanted when he wanted them to. Whereupon General Lee, who witnessed it, said, how can you expect to control these men when you've lost control of yourself? So these kinds of mental disorders, if you will, 
afflicted everybody that was involved. Now, switching topics for a little bit here. We all know that trauma and children don't mix well. It just goes badly for everybody. Between 200,000 and 420,000 males under the age of 17 were involved in the American Civil War. It's estimated that 100,000 Union soldiers were 15 years or younger. Why is that important? A very recent study where they looked at 303 out of 20,000 Union Army companies found that greater exposure to death of military comrades and younger exposure to war trauma were associated with lifelong cardiac, gastrointestinal, and nervous disease. It did not go well for most of those young soldiers. The kinds of symptoms that they saw included paranoia, psychosis, hallucinations, and here's you know, a whole laundry list, confusion, delusions. This was not a good thing for those kids. So those of you who have been studying the Civil War probably longer than I have, have heard of the concept of the irritable heart. This was actually invented as a concept by a Dr. Albrecht von Haller in the 1700s and was not connected to warfare. He basically saw that there were a number of particularly men that had atypical chest pain. One of the other, oops, went too fast there. One of the other um, disorders of the time, this is a, what we would call today a kitchen sink diagnosis is neurasthenia basically described when you, when you couldn't figure out what else was going on with somebody, you would call that, that disorder neurasthenia. Uh, you knew that they were severely impacted. You really weren't quite sure why. So where did soldier's heart come into this? Well, Dr. Jacob DaCosta, who was a Civil War physician, evaluated 300 Union soldiers who were referred to him for irritable heart. But what he found was that for combat soldiers, that there was a special version of irritable heart, if you will, that included uh, symptoms such as fatigability, headache, diarrhea, dizziness, disturbed sleep, and it got worse over time. Things did not get better. That was not necessarily true of irritable heart. Another major disorder that was diagnosed in the 1800s, mind you, psychiatry was in its infancy at that time, was a concept called monomania. Monomania, this is a quote from a manual from 1838 that I happen to have a copy of. Basically, the patient has imbibed some single notion contradictory to common sense and to his own experience and which is dependent on errors of sensation. Now, what does that mean? In real terms, that meant that we had a lot of soldiers out there believing that their legs were made of glass or that snakes, fish, or eels had taken up their abode in their stomach or bowels. Now, you might think that this is rather fanciful, but actually when I worked at the state mental hospital, I had patients who had very similar uh, kinds of problems. One of the interesting things that he said here was that the hallucinations propagated from diseased parts of the brain. And the only way to really diagnose it was to dissect the brain after death. Now, if you're a psychiatrist and you told your patients, the only way I can diagnose you is by dissecting your brain, you might not have a lot of business, but that's how things were back in the 1830s when this manual was written. Another major disorder that was diagnosed in the 1800s was moral mania. Moral mania was found with people who were very paranoid, ostentatious, um, easily excited. They're riveted to the most absurd opinions, prone to controversy, but incapable of reasoning. 
Oops. And they're always the hero of their own tales. They use a lot of hyperbole um, and they engage in unnatural gesticulation, which largely means flailing your arms and that sort of thing. Now, when you look at these criteria, although this was written in 1838, when you look at these criteria, you might think, oh, gee, that's, that's similar to a lot of politicians that I'm familiar with. However, the, the big difference is that if you throw in violence towards others and sometimes towards themselves as part of this, it, it makes a big change. Uh, most politicians don't act out in a violent way, uh, even though they say these kinds of things. So what did they find when they were looking at the longitudinal impact of, of this POW camp experience? They found basically that those that were in the poorer camps really did very poor socioeconomically and psychologically they, and physically. They just simply did not do well. Another interesting finding was that they had uh, where there was a severe paternal hardship, it led to higher mortality amongst their sons, but not their daughters, born after the war. And the study authors are basically saying part of this was from nutrition and part of it was from uh, psychological means. In other words, these people were very malnourished and they didn't have the right kind of nutrition and they passed it on to the next generation. Why females didn't suffer as badly as the males, hard to say. So today, how do we look at this? This is from the current Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. When somebody experiences a violent traumatic event, there are groups of different kinds of characteristics that occur. Derealization is, is very common it's a sense of being in a mental fog. Depersonalization is being detached from one's mental processes or body with intact reality testing. And dissociative amnesia, this one's very common, inability to recall what happens. So a very traumatic event occurs and you just can't remember it or what you remember is very foggy. It goes very well with derealization and and it's very difficult to tease out the difference. Dissociative fugue, this should ring familiar to a lot of you folks that have looked at nostalgia, having been diagnosed at that time for a lot of soldiers, the sudden relocation from home or one's customary place of work. Um, it's really uh, very difficult for people to get out of that state of a fugue. And dissociation the presence of two or more distinct identities or personalities that recurrently take control of the individual's behavior. If you've seen the movie Sybil, it depicts it pretty well. This is a very rare phenomenon. It just simply doesn't occur that often. Most of your shock responses are gonna be in the top four that are listed, uh, listed here on this slide. So why does this happen? Well, guess what, as human beings, we have stress hormones and cortisol is probably the major perpetrator. We don't have time for a thorough discussion of, of uh, physiological stress, but everybody has their own approach to dealing with stress. And in very dramatic circumstances, pupils dilate, the heart rate increases, but everybody has their own approach. Some people engage in the fight uh, they move forward when they're under stress. Some people are into the freeze mode where they just totally freeze when they're under stress and other people are into flight. So this is where you've heard of that concept. So what does that look like with when you're dealing with the thoughts and the feelings associated with stress under traumatic conditions? It's very difficult, unless you know the person very well, to focus on the thinking-oriented risk factors. And you've got old Homer over here who can't think straight on a regular day. He doesn't need a lot of trauma. But poor concentration, confusion, uh, disorientation, these are the kinds of 
thinking issues that go on with people that are under major stress, emotion-related behaviors are a little easier for most people to notice. So you have shock and numbness and feeling overwhelmed and feeling lost. And you know, fear is a major element of the emotion that strikes people under trauma. So for combat, what we know, and this is from the more recent research, is that there are some things that set the stage for soldiers that might be predisposed to post-traumatic stress disorder. Isolation from friends, family, and home. It's still up there. It's a big one. Um, ambiguity of mission or role in the mission. Powerlessness in managing daily or mission-related activities. Boredom, that's a common thing when you're stuck out there in the middle of nowhere waiting for something to happen. Danger or threat to personal welfare, or in some cases, you're just overwhelmed with the work frequency. So these are the things that all of your first sergeants and your company commanders are drilled in, in terms of focusing on helping their soldiers and their units become more effective. But when that doesn't happen, you see that there are specific combat related trauma symptoms. Now this is also typical of general post-traumatic stress disorder, but these are pretty well known. Reliving the event, avoiding situations that remind you of the event, negative changes of beliefs and feelings, uh, fear and anger or vacillation between fear and anger, really common, and feeling keyed up, hyperarousal, probably the most common symptom that when soldiers report for counseling, that is, is troubling them. And how many combat vets actually experience PTSD? The RAND Corporation did a fairly robust study in, in 08, and they came up with a figure of 13.8% in general. Other studies vacillate between five and 20%, depending upon when the study was made, who was in the study, that sort of thing. But one of the things they agree on is that when you add a history of deployment-related concussions, it skyrockets to 33%. So let's talk about that for a minute. Post-traumatic stress disorder has some kind of benchmark characteristics, the flashbacks, the nightmares, the arousal, the social avoidance. But you see over there on the side, MTBI, that's mild traumatic brain injury. That's neurological deficits, seizures, and headaches with migraine features. But right there in the middle, this is known as a Venn diagram, you have the characteristics that are common to both. So diagnos diagnosticians have to struggle with how much of this is which. Uh, impaired concentration, tension headaches, sleep disturbance, irritability. In many instances, um, soldiers will be diagnosed with both traumatic brain injury and PTSD. So what's the trajectory look like here? What are we really concerned about? Well, one of the big concerns is the likelihood of impulsive, assaultive, or suicidal behavior. Obviously readiness, medical readiness to be fit for combat is the overriding concern. But here, this is kind of on the negative side of the ledger. If you have severe prolonged trauma, traumatic brain injury, severe prolonged depression, and you've been doing a lot of drugs and alcohol, it's probably not a good thing and you're moving in a real negative direction. Now, the way clinicians tend to look at this is what's the frequency, intensity, and duration of each of these? And what's the person's history of coping with these things? So how do you deal with that when you're in combat? We have today what are called combat operational stress teams. And we all went through training at Fort Sam Houston at Army Medical Command. And we use this real simple four point scale to determine where a soldier's status is at. So if you're doing a sit rep, 
on a soldier on your unit, one of the things your company commander is gonna ask you if you're a first sergeant is where is everybody at? Are they ready? Are they in the reacting mode? Or do we have a lot of people that are injured? So after a major battle, you're looking at a lot of people moving between reacting and injured. Where we get concerned is where people engage in behaviors that are moving them towards the ill state. And that's where we have to take soldiers offline. And in some cases, they don't have to go to combat. Um, we've seen it here stateside where we've had to remove people from the firing range because they are reflecting on things that have happened to them in combat when they were previously deployed. So what do we do when that happens? Well, this is a very simple procedure that's used in the theaters of combat where you pull them, if you're in Afghanistan, you, you pull them back. They're not allowed to go outside the wire for X amount of time. And it's rest, rehydration, restoration of confidence. Uh, you kind of redirect folks. This is where the combat operational stress control teams and the chaplains work together to help people get ready, uh, ready to go back into and return to duty. And most do, most do after a period of time. For those that don't, they are then evacuated to a restoration center. And you can think of that as like a mash. You're, you're still in, in theater, but you're away from the forward operating base. And if, if that doesn't help enough, then they're evacuated to a military treatment facility. We sent a lot of people to um, our MTF in Germany that uh, really helped a, a lot. And some soldiers came back from those events and others were sent back to uh, the United States. So why are we doing all this? What's the whole point behind this? Well, it has to do with the, the current concept of resilience. And resilience really isn't that new of a concept. It's just been reformulated and broken down in terms of the kinds of things that promote resilience on an individual level and also detract from it. So if you spend a lot of your psychological energy in rational thinking and mental flexibility, ability to manage your emotions and finding meaning in what you're doing, then there's a pretty good likelihood you're gonna move into recovery pretty fast and that you might actually learn something out of the experience. And that's where you see growth that's known as post-traumatic growth. But we also have a number of soldiers that get caught up in kind of the negative intrusive rumination and hyperreactivity, and they cannot get out of the negativity and they're moving in the direction of impairment. And in some cases, we're able to get some of those soldiers back to recovery. Um, and it, it varies with the circumstances as to whether that's the case. So that's on an individual level. But let's take a look at resilience from the standpoint of history. Historically, resilience was known as hardiness. And if you go back uh, many years, including the Civil War, we talk a lot about hardy people. We ask the question, why do some soldiers seem to react well to the stress of combat and others seem to fold under the stress of combat. And there's a lot of different theoretical models that address this these days, but it's generally true that if you can handle that kind of stress well, you're able to get back into combat pretty quickly after a major event. So let's take a look at what that means in terms of the history of, of the Civil War versus today. A study back in 2010 of 35,000 Union Army infantry, one of their major findings was that men exposed to wartime stress were less likely to develop cardiovascular disorders later in life if they were in more cohesive companies. They basically are saying that a lot of the cardiovascular conditions, if they'd had the language and the system at the time, would have been diagnosed as psychiatric conditions but that the protective factor that was involved here 
was having a social support network that helped keep people together and focus on uh, supporting one another. So what does that mean in terms of today's soldiers? It shouldn't be a huge surprise for people familiar with this work that it's the same that it's not just an issue of focusing on individual hardiness or resilience, it's how you work with the unit. They basically found in a survey of soldiers that went to Afghanistan, that the teams that were the most cohesive, they had each other's backs physically, mentally, psychologically, emotionally, these guys had each other's back and they did not experience mental health problems of the same nature as, as the more diffuse units that where there was a lot of infighting and problems. So just to show you that this isn't a new concept at all, Confucius said way before the Civil War, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. And not long after the Civil War, Mark Twain picked that one up and said, look, courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, but not the absence of fear. So that's what I have to offer today. And I hope that I can answer questions and provide some additional insights at a later time. So thank you for your attention.